Hello. Hello. That was that was awesome. I thought you were gonna like come out and like be like a friendly warning before our chat. I was told by the people at YouTube it was going to get a little spooky in here. <laughs> I love it. A good little uh, Frankenstein opening to set expectations. I've not paid anybody in the audience to run out screaming at any point in time. So if you hear any rumors, it was not I. <laughs> we don't have any nurses on staff, please. <laughs> be safe. No. No. Um, well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here, whether you're live, you're watching the replay while doing the dishes, which is my favorite thing to do whilst podcasting and YouTubing. My name is Lauren, and I've been knee deep in all things Frankenstein this past month. What an honor, what a privilege. And I'm also very honored to have a very special guest here. Mr. Andrew here, if you want to introduce yourself. Hello, yes, I'm Andrew it's from It Came From The Page. Uh, I read a lot of Universal Monsters fiction, so I was very excited to do this. <laughs> very excited to have you, yes, because I feel like I mentioned this in my um, March TBR video that I feel like anytime I'm with you on a live stream, for sure, I'm going to be laughing, but I'm going to be like learning a lot too. So I love how you talk about things. I don't feel like a lot of other people, because I look for people on YouTube, like pretty actively that like, like my niche topics. And I love that you love classic horror. I love that. Yeah. So the, the, the actual name, it came from a page was like, so I had a podcast briefly, um, was called Triassic Park, where I would like, what well, the point was to like review and talk about all dinosaur fiction before the movie Jurassic Park came out in cinemas. So just like going through all of the, the history. Uh, and then I had like a brief spinoff series that I was gonna do all about like, it came from the page was like adapting and talking about classic universal monsters. So I got all of this like like background information that I that I bought and I, I stored away for that. And then right before I did that episode is when I first had my stroke. So then I wasn't able to do this. So like, this is a, this is, this is nice. Cause it's like a culmination of something that was like kind of left undone. Uh, so this is a, a great excuse to finally finish a project that I wanted to do for a while. So. Yay. What an evolution. It's funny because I also started a podcast before I started a YouTube channel. I feel like there's a podcast to YouTube pipeline. <laughs> there must be that exists. I guess I definitely I definitely agree. There's a few more YouTubers that you wouldn't expect it, but they, they have a podcasting background too. So it's just uh, it's interesting. Yeah, very transferable. Um, so yes, so happy to be here. Um, probably gonna be here for like about an hour. Um, because we have our lives. Obviously, I can't hold Andrew hostage, although I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> That's recorded forever. <laughs> That's recorded forever. I'm locked away. You have me like the you like whenever I'm not on live, I'm like the the Frankenstein's monster, like in the thing and Bride of Frankenstein, where they like put him in that whole cage. And like, <laughs> oh, absolutely, yes. You're in quicksand. I'll preserve you in ice. Like, <laughs> I've seen way too many of these freaking movies. <laughs> oh god, there's so many. I love it. I know. Amazing. They're amazing. <laughs> they are, yes. Um, so yeah, we're going to be here probably for like around an hour just chatting um, about Frankenstein, Universal Monsters, rendition of that. Um, and yeah, say hi in the chat. We have Katrina. Hello. Hello. Katrina. Hello. We have Brooklyn. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good, morning. good night. I love that YouTube gave me an appreciation for time zones and awareness of that. <laughs> <laughs> that is very true. Hello, Leandra. Thank you so much for reading three books that I recommended, giving those a shot. I'm always trying to push horror onto people. It's the, I think, um, ugly stepchild of the literary world. So thank you, Leandra, for trying that out, going outside your comfort zone. Amazing. And then hello, Liz. Hello. Love it. Liz has a big background um, researching doing like basically a PhD, I'm pretty sure, in um, like silent horror films or just silent films in general. So I know there's, um, before we have Universal Monsters movies that we know it, they did have their like silent film era. So I'm sure that informed a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. Like there were like, this, there were three silent films before that original Frankenstein. So it's really interesting because two of them are lost. Um, one of them is, I believe, a Mexican film, Il Monster de Frankenstein. Uh, and then there is a movie called, it's like something like Life Without a Soul. What is it called? Sorry, I got to look that up. 
I light. Yes, it is life without a soul. I should have trusted myself from 1920. And then the only one that survives is that Edison one from 1910. Have you seen that by the way? No, I haven't. I read it in a book and I meant to go search it up. Cause isn't it just like a few minutes? Yeah. It's only it's like very brief and it's on, it's on YouTube. And like, there was this big thing, like it was lost for years. I was reading a bunch of stuff from the seventies. And every time I came across that in the seven, like books of like on the history from the seventies, they're all like, Oh, this is a lost book. Oh, this is lost. And it wasn't until I read a book called the cultural history of Frankenstein, where I discovered that the reason why it was lost for so long is, um, was solved because somebody in the 1980s from box office magazine wrote an article that was like oh here are the most important films that have been lost to time and somebody in wisconsin was like oh i have that <laughs> and then for the next like 20 years he did he he for profit showed it at like screenings and stuff like that but wouldn't let anyone archive it wouldn't let anyone do anything with it until finally when dvds came out and it was cheap to reproduce something he put it on uh, a dvd with nosferatu uh and mm. then uh finally it got out there and archived and everyone like finally got their hands on it but for years it was just impossible to see and it's 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 an oddity, but it's a fun. It's good. It's worth watching, especially it's like ten minutes. So it's like oh yeah. After this, I'm for sure gonna watch that on YouTube. I just that's so wild to me because like with a history background, I just be like so annoyed that they're like hoarding oh, something yes. that could have been so useful to like all these film critics and and writers to like have some type of origin story and like maybe their first rough cut of interpreting Mary Shelley's book. That's so annoying. <laughs> yeah. And it's also like, I would be so scared because like, it's a film, like it's film is like so delicate and like, so like, so flammable and like, so yes. like, <laughs> it's awesome. like you, got, you got like one copy of it. And I think he like, he, he got it like put on the 35 millimeter. So it was copied at least once, but like, still, I would be so scared if it only existed on film. I'd be like, I must steal this from you. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, that's the one thing you take out of his home. <laughs> it's just the film. <laughs> I'm only here for the film. <laughs> Priorities, right? Morals? <laughs> Ethics? <laughs> oh, yes. I'm so glad that you love Goddess of Filth. Have you read Goddess of Filth, Andrew? By V. Castrum? Uh-oh. 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 You but oh you're back okay you like okay. did I oh uh, did uh, did I freeze as well or did you freeze oh I have a history of having poor internet so probably maybe it was me oh, okay <laughs> it was just for a few seconds that I was like uh oh <laughs> <laughs> I'm back I'm back you're back you're back we're good hello Maya hello hello I know it's pretty late over there for you. Um, oh, okay. Hey, Steph. How you doing? Thanks for being here. The Wolfman is my favorite universal monster film, but Dracula is my favorite monster. Bride of Frankenstein is the best film. I love it. You're dropping down your opinions. I love it. And I know you, Andrew, I feel like I've gathered that you kind of have a soft spot for the Wolfman. I do. I do have a soft spot for the Wolfman. I do. I, I, cause it's, I think like it's like it comes from a background of reading too many behind the scenes features where everyone kind of just craps on Lon Chaney Jr. all the time. So what? Because they just think he's a terrible actor. They people don't like Lon Chaney Jr. He's he well let's let's. <laughs> I think he's good as the Wolfman. I think he is like yes. golden to play the Wolfman. He yes. is a terrible Frankenstein. We'll get into that later, but he is a lot of good Frankenstein. Um, although he was in a TV version of Frankenstein once. Um, and he was also bad in that, but it looks different. Um, it was like from the 50s. And apparently when they filmed it, he had thought that they were doing a dress rehearsal, but they were actually doing it all the way through. So occasionally in that, like it's called like Terror Tales to to terrify i believe it's like this episode and like he does all these things like the, the the frankenstein monster would do where it's like destroy things but he thinks it's a dress rehearsal so he like picks up a chair and he puts it back down and he's like, all these but it was really recorded <laughs> yeah it was really recorded and it just made it onto the line <laughs> just like, i don't know how much of that is true how much of that is legend but that is what uh, people say and it's his very funny. father is rolling in his grave uh, but yeah. he for sure is a great wolf man like just his facial expressions will do so many close-ups of the way his like um eyebrows will like just crunk crinkle and he just looks so like existential he's just the most like 
existential crisis monster I've ever seen. Like he's he's a vibe. He's a vibe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like it's one of those things where like it's like when you watch like Wolfman in modern day, it's it's interesting because it, it actually kind of gets more psychology right about what it's like to be somebody who like you know we like there's a whole bunch of like serial killer movies that come out and like they normally like just have a bunch of like very dangerous bad research on as far as like you know psychology and stuff like that goes but like when you look into like the actual situation it's kind of more akin to like a wolfman situation mm. where like it'll be like outburst and like because i remember i was listening to this book about like the history of people studying serial killers and for a while it was they would call them the werewolf of blank the werewolf of like it like oh like, yeah that was like a, a one-to-one which is just kind of interesting but yeah it's oh, uh, that's so true yeah that's like the origin of serial killers that's part of that history of like thinking of them as like werewolves like these othered beings when in reality they're actually literally just humans yes yeah exactly 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 like we're actually the monsters shocker <laughs> <laughs> Scooby Doo got it right, guys. <laughs> yes. Uh, when I was in college, a can of nitrate film ignited in an archival room, and they had to evacuate an entire block. Damn. See, that's a, those things go up like nobody's business. It's wild. Those things are so unhinged. It reminds me of a scene from Inglorious Bastards where you have, I think it's like Samuel Jackson's like narrating like the importance of like what they're gonna do later with that can of film and their plans. That's what I think of every time people talk about nitrate. <laughs> yes. That's that him. movie actually. Yeah, that movie actually taught me like it was so flammable. So I think that's why I always go back to it. Yeah, I think I think I think in the same way. It's like why I always count three like this for no reason. Yeah. I always do it like this. Always now. <laughs> it is <laughs> always. <laughs> Hello, Claudia. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, everybody who's here. We have some people on the live, which is awesome. We have Universal Monsters fans. I definitely feel like it's um, not the most like trendy thing to be talking about. Like you have Lisa Frankenstein, which came out um, in February, so like a month ago at this point. We have um, Nosferatu coming out later on this year in December, around like Christmas time, which I think is very much like a Universal Monster light connection. Like it's not the most like you know, um, deeply um, wound movie with this kind of, um, this world, this franchise. So it's nice to see that even though this is not something that's like a super trendy topic right now, you know, I'm not talking about, um, you know, I'm trying to think about what are some popular things right now, like The Omen or like anything that's really like <laughs> Ghostbusters. Like I love these things, but like, this is like the thing I go back to and it's oh, like my man. forever constant. So it's nice to see that there's fans here for this. <laughs> Yes, yes. And it's like, cause like, I feel like the, the, like the early, like 2010s to the 2020s, it's like, they just keep failing the, the universal monsters. Like, it's just like one failure after the other. Like, yes. I, I really liked that, uh, like the Blumhouse Invisible Man. I thought that one was really, really interesting. I haven't seen that. That is um, on my list ASAP yeah, this year. I swear good. I'll see it. Yeah, that one's good. It's it's dark though. It's it's a it's a it's a horror movie. Uh, but like they they haven't done any more with that. Like there's like Ryan Gosling is supposed to be the Wolfman, which I'm like, I mean, mm. uh, I mean, okay, yeah, sure, Just put a bunch of hair on him. We'll see. Um, but like it's. It's been so they tried to do that thing with the, the the dark universe with the mummy and it was Tom Cruise mummy, right? Yeah, like the that. Tom Cruise mummy and oh my goodness. And because Rump the original mummy is my favorite. Like the the, the oh. two, like Brendan Fraser, like oh, the Brendan Fraser. <laughs> The chokehold that movie had on my family Those? growing up, we'd reenact the scenes and everything. We're obsessed yes. with it. Yes, I was like, I was like, I, for a second, I thought you were talking about the Universal one. I was like, I don't think anyone will, you like the Universal <laughs> 30s mom. I did I'm see like, that one. I did see it. <laughs> that franchise, by the way, the worst of all the franchises because Damn. that the first one is is fine, but also very questionable from a modern perspective. Uh, like every second, you're like. Yes. Well, this is cultural yes. appropriation to the extreme. Yes. Um, but like, as yeah, so just you can, I can understand why it's iconic. And blah, blah blah. The rest of them are like you're watching somebody walk slowly for like hours upon hours. Like the mommy shuffles and he shuffles and he shuffles, and I'm like, this movie's only an hour, and I think I've watched ten minutes of him going down a set of stairs. And like, Lon Chaney Jr. is the mummy in the rest of them as the mummy carries. Really? And they're all bad. 
No, no. I seen one <laughs> clip of the Abbott and Costello meet the mummy. And all I saw was him coming out of the mummy, coming out of the uh, like sarcophagus or whatever, or the whatever. And um, the costume, like it's so clear he's not wrapped. It's literally just a big <laughs> PJ set onesie. And I'm like, this, did you try it all? Okay. Where was Jack Pierce? Like, where was anybody? Oh, Jack Pierce, he got dumped. Fired, yeah. Yeah. Well, he got, yeah, he, they 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 let him go um like before even I think like Son of Frankenstein was the last time he was kicked and then they 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 kicked him to the curb because he his process took too long. And it's like if you watch mm. the early movies, you're like, yeah, well, uh, maybe it's because he's really good. You know, yes. <laughs> like he was dropped There's, in 1948. Because There's a very distinct difference between what you have in the first few movies and then later on, which we'll get to. So we'll move, we'll move forward here. Uh, but hello, Melissa. Hello. hello. Hope you're doing well. And again, thank you everybody for being here. We're just going to be talking about Universal Monsters Frankenstein. We're going to get in the weeds. We're going to get um, throughout um, the movies. We're kind of going to broadly touch on that, but um, really focusing on the first two, because there is a lot to talk about. Um, but first off, we have to give credit where credit is definitely due to Ms. Mary Shelley right here. I recently just read Frankenstein in its entirety as an adult this past month. And I read it when I was in uh, AP English senior year. Surprised how much I did actually retain from that. Um, and I'd be curious, have you read Mary Shelley's Frankenstein before, Andrew? Yes, I have. So I was hoping to get to the original text, this, this, like, because, like, there is, like, two versions where it's, like, most people and a thing that I have listened to is, like, the revised edition. And I think it's the original, oh, yeah, it's, it's right there on your thing, the original 1818 text is supposed to be fairly different like things are truncated there's a little bit kind of switched around some people actually think that that's a better version but i i can't say whether or not it is because i wanted to get that but i couldn't but um it's a classic it's like a, an incredible story it's weird when you have this idea of what the monster is for so long and then you go back to read the original because it's very different he is very much like a gothy mo kid monologuing and like it's beautiful like it, it i would never say anything bad about the book it just i had such an attachment to the universal films that it was a very strange dichotomy trying to go from one to the other and try to like kind of envision and imagine that um also like I know Victor is supposed to be terrible, but man, yes. is he unbearable <laughs> in that book. Like, Victor is so bad in that book. I'm like, I hate you, Victor. So <laughs> bad. And I like, literally hate him. <laughs> and there's something about spending time in his head in the book that just makes like, it's like so insufferable. You're like, just take responsibility, dude. It's just take responsibility. <laughs> yeah and like walton is like obsessed with him and it's like he only has his side of the story so it makes sense why he'd be so into him um but i'm curious what age did you first watch universal monster frankenstein movies and then when did you read um this book so i it's it, so like i the idea of what frankenstein was was something like from childhood for sure i don't know if it wasn't until like late teens early college that i actually watched the very first Frankenstein in its entirety and then the obsession just kind of blossomed but um and then I read the book probably about three four years ago I think like I think like, okay. I read it like right after I had the stroke because like I had the stroke and then I had someone else come in and take over for that episode so I wanted to listen to the book and then listen to their their their, mm -hmm. their takes on it um and yeah it was a it, it was a great book it's surprisingly progressive for its times like there are references to like how it's wrong what they're doing in North America, like how like yes. colonization is wrong mm -hmm. and like stuff like that. We were just like, that's a that's impressive stuff to yes. say in an eighteen. And it got published. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like, um, it's it's always interesting because like sometimes when you read behind the scenes stuff about Frankenstein, it almost feels like men are trying to like undermine how important and how good Mary Shelley is because like they talk about all these possible influences that she would have had and like how she'd be like oh she was here so she might have been this and taken it from this and blah 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 and it's like guys like no idea ever comes from a vacuum like like the idea of original ideas is not true because mm -hmm. we are a culmination of all of our experience so yes. every single piece of media 
and every story that person tells is not from a vacuum it's from lived in experiences and like things that you take from your your real life and stuff like that and to put it and write it in such a good amazing package that basically started the genre of science fiction uh is a pretty important thing it's pretty yes. important yes uh, absolutely and one of my favorite little facts about that is um the 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 movie coming out actually really helped to kind of kickstart even more uh female horror writers because this <gasps> really got, i didn't know that because the 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 book got republished in strange tales um that like that anthology like magazine and i don't know if you remember like because i i know you also read monster she wrote as well Yes, um, and yeah. I was kind of I, I I I meant to go back to like look at the thing to figure out where the dates are because like there was a few uh, female horror writers who got their starts in uh, like in Strange Tales and like I kind of wonder if part of that was because that Mary Shelley thing got serialized and republished again in that magazine. That oh, because you're seeing of, like the timeline match up there. Yeah, yeah, and it like kind of like in my because like. Strange Tales is where, like, a bunch of, like, H.P. Lovecraft stuff got thing, blah, 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 and, like, all the stuff people know, but there was also, like, there were women contributing to Strange Tales, and, like, I I want to I want to go back and do a more in-depth research on that to see if that had any impact, but, like, I thought that was kind of interesting that it got republished in this magazine that was mainly filled with male horror writers that get allotted when like someone like hp lovecraft stole so much from uh, frankenstein you know what i mean like, wow okay that's yeah coming full circle i think that's really cool that you could like kind of see that there's like um some pushing of, of women's writing in the release of this movie i really like how liz kind of put it um for me i did just like it I didn't really love it. And I think it might've had a lot to do with, like you mentioned, Victor just not really enjoying him. But I, I think like that's kind of like part of the process. I think she did that for a reason, obviously. Um, we all know that. But I think it had a lot to do with like it being such a big part of our culture. Like there's just no way for you to kind of go in fresh and give this what it deserves. Yeah. Especially as somebody like, like myself who's like a little um, like older. And I feel like I've read a lot recently that has a lot of... Um, references to her stuff so i think maybe having it like really spoiled then i was trying to in the middle of reading this figure out how i can best read this in a way that i can get something out of it and one thing that really came up to me um is this idea of like grief in its role which it wasn't talked about when i was in my ap english class it was mostly talking about the obviously like the language and the way it's written and we talked about like romanticism and that kind of thing but we didn't really talk about like death and how this could be interpreted as like grief horror and how so much of his life is like revolving around death and one movie i think picks up on that in a very interesting way that's very new is um the angry black girl and her monster which oh, they I really mean, run with that yeah have you seen that at all no no that's been on my list for ages though like i, I want to watch that that's that sounds awesome though like that's really yeah cool. it's good the ending is a little like mm, like the last five minutes i could have done without because it would have been a little more impactful but i see why they would include it and it really takes this idea of like death and grief and what that has meant and what it looks like today for the black community and really like focuses on that in a very interesting way but i think that's like not what a lot of people pick up on when they read mary shelley's frankenstein that he is so informed by his experiences with death and loss of people and then it also kind of culminates too and it contributes to a spiral so i found that fascinating i think i gave yeah. this book a 3.5 star yeah no i'm i'm like kind of in the same the the, th the same kind of realm in that like I respect the heck out of this book. Like I yes. would never ever call it a bad book ever. It's just like how much it impacted me. And like, it's just like one of those things that I kind of wish I would have read earlier. Probably yes. like it, it would have been a, a better thing to start out with rather than, you know, exist in a world where it's. <laughs> yeah, definitely a different experience. Um, and I really wanted to read this because, um, and Brooklyn also read it alongside me. I wanted to read this because there are so many, so many retellings of this book. I, I spent this whole month watching movies that were derived from this that are like no later than the like 70s. Like there's so much modern stuff. And then all the retellings that have come out in the past, like five years, 10 years that do really interesting things that like take Elizabeth's perspective and you really focus on that. And you think about um, how I, when I was reading it, 
Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, I really wanted more of like Elizabeth to be in there. It makes me curious about why Mary didn't like really focus on that. But then you get that in different, more modern books. So this book for me had to be read. It really did. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. No, no. One hundred percent. It like it inform for informs so much of pop culture. It like so much of pop culture. The building blocks are in this novel, and it's like really strange to finally like read it all and be like, oh, that's from there. Oh, that's from there. Oh, yes. that is also from there. <laughs> you know. Like, yes. Yes. And I think Frankenstein is paired so much with Dracula. Do you feel like they have very similar cultural ripples or do you feel like one overshadows the other in terms of like its significance culturally? So I think you like, without a doubt, uh, Frankenstein is a much better novel than Dracula. I, I would agree personally. I, I have not read Dracula since like I was really young and I love Dracula. Like I love that book. But I know if I revisit that, I will not like that book as much. Nowhere near as much as I did back then. I, I have listened to enough things that I've liked each other. And like um, Dracula has always kind of been overshadowed by Frankenstein, I feel like. Especially yes. like if you're talking I about agree. the world. Mm -hmm. um, I personally, I, I look like Dracula retellings are like my jam always. Like I love Dracula retellings. I love... Mm -hmm appearances of dracula uh but dracula has kind of become more of a pop culture icon that's even surpassed the history of its creator in a lot of ways where i think yes. frankenstein because of course it's frankenstein it's all about creation it's all about creation of life uh the creator is always tied into that so like nobody forgets mary shelley anymore like they think that we did back in the day, but nobody yes. nowadays does. That's such a good point. That is so true. Yeah. And uh, this is like just a side point here. Um, <laughs> the change up of the, um, I'll, I'll go to my next slide here. Um, the change up of who plays Dracula was so disturbing to me. When you get towards the end of this franchise timeline, I was like, this is not working for me. Only Bella can be my Dracula. <laughs> what? You mean you mean you don't like John Carradine as Dracula? No. Who doesn't do anything and he just has a top hat and he's got like And he looks at you and I'm like, no. Oh. No. You're like, poor like, John Carradine. Apparently he was he tried out for the original Frankenstein too and he didn't get it. But that's I that, that one is up in the air because like sometimes he said that and like no one can really tell if that actually if he did get a string queen test. He is in Bride of Frankenstein though, briefly. He's like one of the, he's one of the hunters who shows up and is oh like, God, oh, this guy's having fun and drinking and smoking with this blind man. I gotta shoot him. And he's like one of those guys. So Oh, um, okay, in the scene. Yeah, the yeah. two come into the little hut. Okay. Yeah, he's one of those. And he's like, he's Well, so should have stayed at that instead of Dracula. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Can I, can I briefly do my rundown on the stage production before we get here? Oh, yes, 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 yes. I want to say some highs to Christine. Hello. Yes, hello. 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 Yes. Thanks so much for popping in. Yes. Yeah, so tell us, because even before we have this whole franchise from Universal Films that goes from 1931 to 1948, there is actually a moment in between um, the creation of Mary Shelley's actual novel itself. And before we even have like film producing these things, we do have some stage plays that interpret her story, which I personally think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Andrew, um, that it actually does have some origin stories to how we see all of these movies play out. I would say definitely. It's like, it is like the missing piece when you go from the book to the films, um, because like characters like Fritz, Fritz uh, is not in the novel, uh, but he dates back to 1823 uh, in one of the earliest stage productions, Presumption or the Fate of Frankenstein. And that one was actually attended by Mary Shelley herself. So Fritz is a character that's existed long, so long. What? That, she saw the play yeah. production of that? Oh God, yeah, she saw, she Good, saw the play so production of Fritz uh, and she thought it was amusing. Like uh, they, they, there's like a little thing. Like, he's the like, assistant, oh. right? Yeah, yeah. He's, okay, yeah. he's the assistant. Who yeah. has like who it's so funny that he survived from 1823 to 1931. And then as soon as Igor came along, there was no more Fritz. You don't see Fritz in anything anymore. Even though all these yeah. characteristics are there, it's just people like Bella goes, yes, Igor, they hired to hang me once. And he gets on his neck. I love, I love his performance as Igor, but before I get too far off the thing, uh, there was actually by 19, 1823, there were actually five different adaptations um, of the, the 
the the book, and it was immediately a hit on uh, the the screen of the stage, not the screen. <laughs> the stage production of The Presumption or The Fate of Frankenstein, easily the most famous one. So it was popular? Was, oh yeah, oh yeah, it was very popular. Okay. And like, we're talking like there were comedy versions, there were burlesque versions. Like we're talking like as soon as, as soon as it, it, it wow. happened, there was like saucy bits, there was comedy bits, like everything that we would go to see as the, the films go on and on and on, it was instantly there on the stage, which is so interesting to me. Uh, and by 1927, the play that really was the important aspect for these films is the Peggy Webling play, uh, because her play was actually adapted for the 1931 film. Uh, and that's where a lot of the more weird parts like for some reason, it's Henry Frankenstein instead of Victor okay, yeah, Frankenstein. Why? Why was that? I was like, you did not need to do that change up. I, I, who knows? Who knows? I think some people, uh, like, um, there was like a famous actor at the time, which I think was like one of the, like one of the, the proposed people think that might have been a reason why the name was mm. changed. Uh, unclear. Uh, but what was interesting in that version, Hamilton Dean played the creature. Now, Hamilton Dean is much more famous for his play of Dracula because he wrote the, the Dracula stage production that was the same adapted for uh screen in, in Dracula. The, oh, okay, gotcha. So it comes Dracula. up again. Yeah, yeah. So Hamilton Dean is like this weird, uh, impactful person. And what's funny is uh, Hamilton Dean also played the golem uh, on stage. And when Bela Lugosi did his screen test for Frankenstein before he left the production, he supposedly modeled his makeup. He did all his own makeup. He modeled it after Hamilton Dean's uh, Golem uh, when he when he did the screen test. So um, the, the stage production and that old Hamilton Dean's always coming, always coming mm -hmm. into play. Uh, so the film uh, was adapted for, the play was, sorry, the play was adapted for film uh, with John Balderston as well. He came in to help write the script and Universal bought the rights to adapt the play and they agreed to give Webling and Balderston a cut of profits earned. Except uh, this led to a legal trouble later on because um, both the states were like, hey, you've made a lot more of these Frankenstein movies. Where's our cut? Like, yep. where's our cut? Like, you bought this. It's a sequel to that. It's very clearly a sequel to that. It's like it's tied in. Where's our money? And they they basically had to, like, get it so that they had to do a big payout to their estates. But they made it so that they officially bought the rights to Frankenstein, uh, giving the Universal Monsters. And I just find it so interesting because these plays are really, really important. And... Universal has done such a good job of marketing their monsters as being their monster. You know what I mean? Like yes, the, the possession. Like, yep. Yeah. Yeah. When it's just like, nah, nah, it's all from the plays, baby. All from the plays. <laughs> so. It's so important. I'm so glad you mentioned that because that's something that like when I was doing a little bit of research myself, like you don't really see the origins of that. There's like maybe one book I have that really focused on like the plays and then I, that's where I heard Peggy's name for the first time. And I did hear that connected to a legal battle where, um, you know, she wasn't given actual rights or money compensation for like what her work was in creating the script to, to well, I guess the play to, to movie script. So that's really fascinating that you mentioned that and that they're so influential, but like to me as like a person who's more interested in Universal Monsters and like the average person, I didn't realize just how important that is because Universal does do a great job of like hiding that, hiding that history. Yeah, exactly. I had no idea either until like I was going back and I was like, oh, weird. Like I had no idea that Fritz dated back that far until I read In Search of Frankenstein by Radu Florescu. Uh, and they were talking about how Mary Shelley attended the play version in the eight. And I was like, wow, wow, that's so that wild my that, mind. that Fritz goes back that far. And mm -hmm. then immediately Igor just takes that name out. Fritz just is gone forever. And you're like, what? Bring it's back true. Bring it's back. actually wild because Fritz is in, um, is, is Fritz in the second one? No. So Only that character, one, got, right? yeah, the character that very much is, it's played by the same actor. As yeah. Like Fritz. It's a different and, person. Or but to a right try, he's playing a character named Carl. And that there character got a whole bunch of stuff cut out of 
Bride of Frankenstein. Like Bride of Frankenstein was originally uh, 90 minutes. And the, the film as it is, is like, I think it's like an hour 15. So oh. it's like, so like, there's like, there's like 15 <laughs> minutes on the cutting room floor. And a lot of that is like Carl's stuff. Like there's a bunch, there was a bunch more stuff with Carl, but like how he and Dr. Pretorius got together. And apparently Dr. Pretorius is like, oh yes, I, I, he was there when he botched a, a surgery and I covered it up for him. And you're like, oh, that's why he's like working with them. So he doesn't get arrested and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's weird. Cause like in, in, at the very end of Bride of Frankenstein, <laughs> the, the creature just kills that Carl for no reason. And you're like, because, like, you know something's been cut. Because it's, like, at the top, he's like, Rrr! and just, like, chokes him off. That's like, such a good point. Like, why? <laughs> like, why did you do Because, like. Why did Carl hate? Because he doesn't do anything to anyone in that movie who doesn't do something to him. Like, he's yeah. reaction, he's being reactive. Like, which is the entire point of the, the movie. Yeah. And, like, all of a sudden, it's just like, but not you, Carl. Rrr! <laughs> Poor Carl. I wish they would have kept a little bit more of that in. Um, but I could see why they, they wouldn't, I guess. I don't know. Because I don't know if 90 minutes was like a typical time length for movies during that time period. Yeah, no. It's like, it. it I think it would have been probably pushing it a little bit to, to do that. And I know they had to do other stuff because of censors. Like, because the censors were really on 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 their case in by Bride of Frankenstein. So like I'm sure like those probably a lot of that stuff was probably intertwined because like there was that story about like this pretty apparently it was a pretty gruesome retelling of a botched surgery by Pretorius to Carl being like this is why he's always in my I wish they would have made it because Pretorius is like one of my favorites when I watched this for a second time this month. Okay. He's ever. literally the best. So I would love more backstory on him. That would have been really great. <laughs> When he's just like drinking in the like in the like the, the, in the bottle tube. Of, in the yeah. tube and he's just like <sighs> and he's just like relaxing and he's like oh I, love I, I thought I was on my own. Like he was just <laughs> that's his Friday nights. He just goes down and drinks with the day. It's called self-care, Andrew. Come on. <laughs> It's his own new weakness. I love how he says that multiple times. I wish I had a I first time. I love that too. I know. <laughs> I thought he was just such a great character level of camp. Like the, um, it really read, I think he performed, played it as like really like drag. Like I loved all of the really oh, yeah. like covert. I mean, I don't know. Cause like at the time, I don't know how much people were picking up on, but it's very clear. You do have um, like James Whale, who I think he's a gay man, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a uh, there's an entire movie um, where uh, it's speaking of Brendan Fraser. Brendan Fraser plays his like housekeeper, like an aging. Um, it's called Gods and Monsters, I believe it's called, and I've it heard is of by Bill Condon, and it's like an adaptation of a book about uh, the end of James Whale's life. And um, he falls in. He's like an elderly man, and he kind of falls in love with. Uh, Brendan Fraser, who is like Ian McKellen, plays uh, elderly James Whale, um, and and um, Brendan Fraser is like his like, housekeeper. Um, but what you'll like is at the very end of the movie, there is they have Brendan Fraser play Frankenstein like briefly, and he's like in the bank and he's like, he's like what? going through going through like a storm, and it's it's very good. But yeah, no, um, both. Uh, Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein are very queer horror films. Like, yes, very queer horror films. Um, so, like, uh, Ernest Thessinger was was also a, a gay man uh, who played Doctor Pretorius, which you know, I can get it. Um, and then, um, then um, there is like, it, Colin Clive, who is like uh, Henry. He's believed to be a bisexual man as well. So, like, there's a lot. He had of... such a sad. Like, the more I realized just how sad his life was. Oh yeah, he had a he had a he had a bad sad life. It was not it was not a, it was not a good life. But uh, yeah, so like there is. Uh, it, it's like in a lot of cases, it's one of those like first big queer horror films. And what's so fascinating is that like people don't talk about that in the books as much. Like, it's very much nope. like recognizing that uh the queer status of the film is something that's very much been happening in the modern day um yep. as people you know thought process and stuff like that change so it's it's interesting but yeah it's uh yeah very uh queer horror films which is awesome that it's like dates that far back yes and i think that was like a newer thing for me where like when i was reading through things and i was able to see um bright and frankenstein for a second time in my life just being able to like read it a little bit more the more i like kind of study 
um, LGBTQ history, knowing like at the time you have really popular, um, yeah, I'm thinking like the 30s. Yeah, you'll have the like female impersonation and like all these things and the pansy freight craze and all, all these other things. And then it gets so popular, like it's even on screen. And it's like, if you know that subculture, you'll see it, you'll pick up on it at the time, I'm sure. Um, but Liz had a really great question. Also want to say hi, Vanessa. Thank you for being here. Um, Liz mentions here, I wonder if young Frankenstein using Igor helps solidify the move away from Fritz since it also reached non-horror fans because it is like a comedy. Yes. Have you seen Young Frankenstein? Only bits and pieces of it because it's so popular, but I've not seen it in its entirety. Do you recommend? Yes, especially because I know you don't. We're going to get to Son of Frankenstein. I know you don't <laughs> love Son of Frankenstein, but Son of Frankenstein is directly parodied in Young Frankenstein. Young Frankenstein okay. is like a, almost like a beat for beat parody of uh, Son of Frankenstein. And it's one of the more the reasons why that movie is a little bit more culturally relevant than it might seem uh, and the thing. And like, cause like that's a film that introduced Igor. And then that's why a big portion of why he is in uh, uh, young Frankenstein. Uh, and that's like a great point that Fritz is, uh, is moved away and Igor takes the place because they're using a bunch of the framework from son of Frankenstein. Now they're obviously still parodying things from like, Frankenstein and Bride, but like the beat for beat plot is really son of Frankenstein. Like he like he's getting off of the like Mel Brooks, uh sorry, not Mel Brooks. Ah, uh, well he was uh Gene Wilder. Gene Wilder is like getting off the the train and he's like on the train station. And he's going back to like the Frankenstein homestead and all that stuff. So it's like and he's like the great grandson kind of thing. So it's it's like really important from that perspective. And I bet you that, yeah. Young Frankenstein had like a, a great impact on that. So that's a great point. I I liked Son of Frankenstein. I think I really liked the first three. And it's weird because Ghost of Frankenstein is kind of growing on me a little bit. Oh, They're no. all kind of, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't know why I don't know what I have against Ghost of Frankenstein, <laughs> but it's like so, I don't know what it is, but like every time I watch it, it's like I'm so bored, I'm tired. I know, I know. I don't know what it is. I think it's just like after the fact, because I did watch all of these. I didn't well, watch um, yeah. the Abbott Costello one recently. I will later on this week, but I have watched that multiple times growing up. Oh, um, it's like so a really good. big, important movie in my childhood. We, the rotation was Abbott Costello me Frankenstein. Then there was um, Dracula, Frankenstein. And those are the ones that like rotated through my family growing up. And then all the rest I like kind of got into is like, an adult. So I'm trying to knock out as many of the franchises as possible, like the little threads of the different yeah. um, monsters. And then I'm going to track them in my journal and see how much I can get through this year. But I'm not going to like pressure myself. But this is a good place to start because it's not just Frankenstein that shows up in here. It's everybody. And you actually have like you those those last three films, like you have made it so easy. So if you if you just want you watch The Wolfman, you've seen all appearances of The Wolfman, like because uh, like all oh. his entire franchise goes the Wolfman, Frankenstein, because Frankenstein meets the Wolfman is way more of a sequel to the Wolfman than there's a Frankenstein movie. Like Frankenstein is in the movie, like it's, like it's granddaughter or something. Like it's a very distant relative that shows up of the Frankensteins, but it's it is much more of a direct sequel to uh, the Wolfman, which is where I think it it works better as a Wolfman sequel than it does as a Frankenstein movie, yes. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then he is, yeah, he is just in House, The Houses, and Abbott and Casello, and like that's it for the Wolfman, uh, which I think is why in literature the Wolfman has more books, because uh, there's Return of the Wolfman by Jeff Rovin, which is impossible to find, but it is on archive.org, thank goodness that's how I read it. But mm -hmm. it is a direct, it's a book from 1998, and it's licensed under Universal Monsters. It is a direct sequel to Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, but it's a serious oh. horror movie. It's a serious horror book. They somehow mm. make it work. They somehow make it work as a sequel to Abbott and Costello, but make it a serious horror film. And it's like, well, book. But it's like really impressive that they do that. But yeah. Is it affiliated with Universal? Like, do they yep. give their stamp of approval? Yep, yep. And the and the oh. cover is uh, Lon Chaney Jr. as the Wolfman, like in like the, the, the makeup. Um, so that's interesting. Um, Dracula, Dracula's daughter is good. I love Dracula's daughter. Okay. Dracula's daughter is great. Son of Dracula is bad. 
It's bad because they get I think I've heard that too. They make John Cheney Jr. play Dracula. It's not good. It's not good. Okay. Can they not? Can they not put him in every role, please? <laughs> I know. And they tried. They tried. And he was the wolf man, and that was about it. Uh, and then um, the Invisible. I think you would like the Invisible Man franchise because it's very weird. Like, there are okay. a few horror movies there. Then there's a few comedies. Like, The Invisible Woman is actually hilarious. Like it's, I didn't know that existed. It's hilarious. It's like the third movie. Uh, Vince's Price is The Invisible Man in the second movie. So that's really cool. Oh, I love him. That'd be so cool. And then that's why in Abaddon Costello, Meet Frankenstein, there's that last gag with uh, they're getting on the boat. And it's like, there's yes. just like a cigarette. And he's like, oh, I'm The Invisible Man. And that's because... Vince's Bright had played the Invisible Man, which is cool. And then there's the Invisible Agent, which is like a World War II movie where it's like, and there's like, it's it's intertwined. Uh, and then there is like, I think it's like Return of the Invisible Man, which is like a more horror sequel kind of thing. But yeah, like that one franchise is really good. Skip the Mummy movie franchise. Believe me. I'm giving, I feel like I'm I would give it a shot. <laughs> I, Listen, it only I think it only takes you four hours to watch them all. So if you have like a lot of housework to do, you put it on and just go to town because like those are bad. Um, but uh, the Creature from the Black Lagoons, which is like it's it's a Universal monster movie, but it's like so far outside of the. See, yeah. Like if you look at like it's like 1954, and you're like that's yes. like very far away from those other movies. Like we're kind of just rubbing it in there. But the first one is great. The second one is. I have the whole box set. I got that for Christmas. So I'm going to, I'm going to go through the thir- all of them. The weird one where it's like, uh, the creature walks among us, which is the third one. I think you would like that one because it's weird. Ooh. It's okay. weird. They try to bring him into civilized society. They put like a suit on him and stuff and like, try to like have him go around. And then all he does the entire movie <laughs> is every time, like there's a guy being like crappy to a lady. He just goes, and just like scares him. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> okay, giving Frankenstein vibes. Wait, I, I actually didn't yeah, realize that there was a whole Dracula franchise. So when you mentioned um, Daughter of Dracula, uh, it reminded me of the more recent movie. I think I mentioned, I wanted to mention this earlier. There's a movie that's coming out this year that I've heard is supposed to be a universal monster, like Dark Universe movie. And it's supposed to be talking about Dracula's daughter. Have you seen any of like the trailers or any talk oh. about Abigail? I, I am not, I am not, oh, like Abbott, oh, like that, okay, interesting, that's I didn't both, know that yeah. connected. Oh, they haven't been highlighting that, I just have read it, and it's not really, like, being talked about or mentioned, even, like, in the trailers, like, a reference, so I think they're trying to, like, do different renditions of Universal Monsters movies um, today, but I think they're trying to, like, kind of distance themselves a little bit. Okay. From, like, Dark yeah. Universe stuff. Dracula's Daughter is another one of the more, like, queer-facing, um, like universal horror movies so it is is definitely worth watching there because like it's like there is like the female vampire like goes after women as well and like is like seducing like women as well I love it. it's like very much yeah like a carmilla kind of thing so it's very interesting i really like that so uh liz mentions here that there's some stuff out there about james whale's history with the legion of decency you might be interested in is this like the um center board I think so. Yeah, I definitely, I, 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 don't, I didn't encounter, cause like, oh goodness, I've read so much that like, there are things that I forgot to write a bunch of like, cause there is a great book called Wasteland, which is about how World War I affected the early horror boom. And it went through all of these people who had encounters with um, various, um, like were from the war, like had experience in World War I and how it shaped all of modern horror. And it's a fantastic book. And one of that, like, there's a big portion all about uh, James Whale's life after, like, you know, he went through World War One, And then Ernest Thessinger was also somebody who went through World War One, And, like, it, the way that it changed your experience was with death and how much mass death you've seen and how much it really affected people's psyche. And, like, some of the gothic images that were used in, like, promotional photos and, like, posters and stuff like that. Like, for Frankenstein? It, uh, no, no, for World War One. Like, oh, and, gotcha. and how that affected Frankenstein and oh, films okay. of its ilk. So that was a really good, if you ever want to read a good nonfiction book. I think that was, like, free on Audible. Like, it was called Wasteland. But Okay, yeah, I'm definitely going to, like, save that because um, I think I've had... Um... 
like when I like I've taught, I've used um, like as a history teacher, I've taught World War One, and at the end of it, because I did know I had like some horror fans in my class, we looked at his um, like clips of Frankenstein through the disability lens of like um, I, outsiders, like how we looked first at like actual primary sources from World War One soldiers, how they felt certain ways, yeah. and if we could relate it to like the story of Frankenstein and like what. Um, he goes through, and so I showed some scenes from Bride of Frankenstein in class, just like planting those little like horror movie seeds in uh, the youth of America, you know, the classics. So I, I love that there's actually a book I can talk, I can get more information about. Um, yes, all this I will. Stuff I, I want to share with them. I will send that to you. But I listened to that last year, so like I didn't, I didn't take all the notes for that when I was doing that last year. But it was really interesting. There was like some interesting uh, tidbits about that. So. I would imagine. And Liz is very happy and excited to see that there's more love for the Invisible Man, which I wouldn't even have known got a modern reboot of this in the past few years. And I've never seen it. I feel like there was no hype about this that at least kind of entered into my world. So have you seen weird. the more recent one? Yeah, like the 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 Blumhouse one, right? The oh, yeah. that's what you were referencing earlier. Yeah. Okay. Yep, 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 yep. That was like, and that's like partnered with Universal as well, which is okay. very. Which is another very interesting thing because, like, they don't have any ownership over the Invisible Man. That's a HG Wells. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's the same as Frankenstein. Oh, like, yeah. Most, most, the only like true original, uh, like Universal monsters they could take full claim over. Uh, definitely the Wolfman. Like, there's werewolves in fiction, but like the way that they told the Wolfman is not based off of anything, at least not to my understanding. And then, of course, the creature from the Black Lagoon, the Bride. The Bride is basically all them. Like essentially, like when you think about it, like that's all. Kinda, um, it does kind of show up a little bit in um, it, it, the book. It does, yeah. So it's like it's like partially theirs, like there's yeah, a little bit of theirs. Um, but yeah, other than that, though, it's like the not they don't have much stuff that's like original to them. Like sometimes you get Jekyll and Hyde in there. That's all. Uh, that's from a book, you know. All that oh stuff, yeah, so. even the like the opera. Yeah, Phantom of the Opera was like, a, I believe it was like a play for a while and stuff like that. Oh, and a book as well, like Gaston mm -hmm. Maru. Oh. Yeah, that feels right. <laughs> uh, oh, and then uh, The Mummy, I guess, but uh, no one should try to take ownership for The, the Mummy <laughs> that, that are not from the 1990s. Those ones are great. I love the Brendan Fraser ones. I would die yeah. for those ones, but. They're not perfect, obviously, but like I think it's the nostalgia, right? Where I think we're all entitled to our problematic faves here and there. Well, I don't. I think it, I think that was a lot better than the the '30s ones, although that's not. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. Have you ever seen any of the Hammer horror uh, Frankenstein movies, like with Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee and that kind of stuff? No, I haven't, but I've seen some of the Frankenstein ones because my mom really loves those. But that was like a passage in one of the books I was reading, and I was like, wait, there's like another franchise of Frankenstein movies that like you move oh. into like the seventies. And so I'm like, Oh my God, I barely even scratched the barrel surface it, here. My gosh. It's it. Those are fun. And like, but I think the Dracula ones are so good. There's like the Christopher Lee plays Dracula in like all of them. Mm -hmm. He is such a good Dracula. Like his Dracula is way I know. better. And like Peter Cushing is so instead like the, the Frankenstein franchise actually follows the doctor instead of the creatures. So like Peter mm. Cushing plays uh, the doctor and he's so evil. The doctor is so evil in those movies. Like it's a full on, he's the villain and he's the villain throughout the entire franchise. Like he comes back and it's him doing a new creation and a new creation, a little bit of this. And it's like, so it just keeps going. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dracula AD 1972, when they really run out of things to do and they bring Christopher <laughs> Lee's Dracula into the 70s. One of the I best think I've watched ever. that one. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good because it's like all like the mod, like you know, it's like yes, 70s okay, London. I have seen that one. <laughs> like they just get Trish Lee. He's like, and I'm also here. Hey, how's it going? I think that was the one where like all of these young people are like in the um this like house, this haunted house yes. or haunted cemetery or something, and they're just all like just half naked yeah. and just at the end of the movie, it's just ridiculous. It's just vibing. <laughs> I'm so glad my mom put that on. She's one. I was like at her house and she just puts it on. And I'm just like watching this. I'm like, okay, as an adult. <laughs> um, oh, wait, I'm going to say hello, Swamp Gas. So happy you're here. And then we did get confirmation that oh. Abigail, which is coming out very soon, this upcoming month, um, was originally called Dracula's Daughter, but it got retitled oh, to the titular yeah. character's name. I mean, that's good. I mean, that's a different name than. Like, as a Countess Mary Zaleska is the name of uh, Dracula's daughter in the original Dracula's daughter. So, I'm that's interesting that Abigail is now the new Dracula's daughter. Oh, interesting. Okay, I didn't know that. See, I, I have so much to 
It's, I'm excited at that prospect Dr of more. Dracula's life. daughter, I love, but it's like it's not something that you would probably get like with like a modern retelling because it's like very much like in the Universal styles where she's like, oh yes, hello, I'm classical Victoria lady. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, that sounds very par for the course. Um, okay, Maddie, have a great Frankenstein when you guys stream. I'm there because I always learn so much. I literally am learning so much right now. I will, I will, uh, cause I, I'm, I'm always, I always like to make sure I give all my facts. I'll like, I'll send you like, cause I wrote a list of like all the things I read and stuff like that. So just like facts from like sources to put it like the, Oh, and I could link that. Want. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. hundred yeah, percent. Um, and then I have a question for you. So if you had to choose, what is your one least favorite of the entire Frankenstein franchise movie? And then what is one that you absolutely love? Like your top, top one, like this is the masterpiece. Hopefully there is one. So Ghost of Frankenstein is my least favorite. I, I can't, I can't. Like, and I know, I know House of Dracula is bad. I know House of Dracula is yes. not good. But yes. there are, there are a bunch of more monsters in it. So it's like, it's bad. But I'm pretty sure that's the one where Wolfman does destroy a door at one point. He goes through a door and it gets destroyed. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Uh, and that's probably it. Um, and... I know it's bad, but Ghost of Frankenstein for me has like nothing for me. Like there is a scene that I like. Like I like that scene where he's like with the little girl. I like, got the beginning and he's like doing things like that. Um, it's a I creepy. Think, yeah, it's like a little creepy and like it's still like there's like a bit of humanity to the monster a little bit. Mm -hmm. But then like they do the brain swapping and you're like, oh my goodness. And then he's like talking like Bell like ghosty and you're like, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. It's only important because it un it makes Frankenstein meets the Wolfman makes sense because like in that movie, the monster is blind. And if you pay attention, there was dialogue. Bela Lugosi fully dialogued the creature, but they removed all of his dialogue. You can see his mouth moving and they removed all of his dialogue. In because the in Frankenstein, one, right? Yeah. Uh, yes, okay, yes. Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. So that's why Frankenstein meets the Wolfman is where that yeah you're Walk telling me yes mm -hmm. because he's blind in the movie he's blind they never tell you he's blind so everyone watched that back as a kid because like what happened is like the reason why all these films are so important to a generation is one because like if you grew up watching them of course but the reason why they have like a more like there's this whole thing called the monster kid generation and those are kid the children of people who grew up with these movies and when the very start of cable started to be a thing there was releases of a bolt, bolt pack of old monster movies to cable because back in the day when cable was just starting they didn't have all these years and years of history to go off on they had a few programs they were fun like running and they need to fill time so they like a whole bunch of movie studios put together packages that you could buy and you once you purchase oh. them you could run them all over, over and over on, and over on cable and yeah. there was a a big package called i believe it's called the shock theater i put this in the legacy probably call uh, it horror scary stuff yeah so in 1957 screen gems released a package for cable called shock movies um and one of the things about halloween is like when you look at the history of halloween back in the 50s that's when like Halloween became what Halloween is today. Yes. So yes. you have this conjunction of these characters at their maximum popularity when Halloween is starting to become a thing. That's almost certainly why there's the tie-in where all Halloween you still see. Uh, even today you see Frankenstein, Dracula, all those things. Oh, absolutely. It's because when they started to uh, monetize Halloween and made it more like a corporate big holiday, uh, it was right at the most popular time for all of these monster movies. And like, that's how uh, this this whole thing started. And it's why we still kind of like see the creature today is because a random movie package for a cable in the 50s. It's so weird. Okay, that's so wild to me because there is a whole history that I'm like kind of lightly familiar with like um, Halloween becoming something big in the United States and then really blowing up internationally. And I didn't realize that there's like that intersection, that moment, that confluence of of movies being such a critical part of that and thinking about like how you needed the creation of like cable and the adaptation of that and like tvs in people's homes in order for halloween really to like kind of blow up culturally that's wild to me that so much had to kind of happen for this holiday that's like so important to me this like 
season frame of mind yeah, it's to like so, actually take place. Cause it, it's so interesting because it happens naturally. It's like, it's like, yes. no, it's forcing that. It's no. like, literally they're like, I don't know. We don't have anything to show on TV. <laughs> uh, I guess we'll show these old movies. Okay. And like, you know, that's when you get all the horror hosts be like, I'm so graves ghostly. And here is the newest, yes. like, you know, and Elvira is like a spinoff of that type of thing. And she's the, probably still the most popular nowadays. So it's, it's oh, always, yes. and that was my parents. Those were my, like, they, I think that's why they watch these movies so much for me growing up, um, like on the weekends, because they're like that monster generation that really grew up around that being kids in the sixties and seventies. That's a big thing for them. And I think yeah. that Ghost of Frankenstein, why it kind of is growing on me, because I did hear before I started this franchise that Bella Lugosi somehow becomes um, the monster himself, even in the beginning where he like refuses to in the first movie to be uh, in a non-speaking role, but then he ends up finding himself back in the franchise. And so I was, but not as like, Frank, um, not as Dracula. And so I was like, okay, what, what could that look like? And then I heard somebody say like brain swapping. I'm like, what is going on? So I think I like the ridiculousness of the ghost of Frankenstein. <laughs> it, it's uh, look, I, I am all for it because it got Bella Lugosi some money because that man, yes. He was screwed over. Universal screwed Bell Lugosi over oh. pretty hardcore. And I think one of the reasons why I like Son of Frankenstein, like I love the movie Son of Frankenstein, but one of the things that I really love about it is that like the director knew that Bell Lugosi was really hurting for money. So what they did is they gave him a very brief Igor was supposed to be barely in the movie. He was supposed to be like a few clips. He's like he was supposed to be like a Fritz, like he was there for a little bit. But he did, he was so in there and so committed to the role. And the director had such a soft spot for Lugosi. He kept writing more things in so that he oh, would come so in and he would get money so that he would be able to like continue to exist. Cause like Bell Lugosi like had a rough life, especially in this area. Cause like we are, you're only a few years away from him being in Ed Wood movies because that's all I could yes. get. Like, yes. um, and he ended up having like a bunch of like health problems and, unfortunately became like addicted to painkillers and like it was really kind of like that's why he couldn't his... um he couldn't work in the ha two house movies right we see him in abbott and costello in 1948 but i believe it's the two where we have john carradine playing dracula when i saw him as dracula first of all i was confused i was like who is this character and i'm like oh my god that's dracula like where is bella he was literally in the other movies and I'm, I had to use research, and they said it, it was probably so far gone in his um, illnesses. Yeah, his, his addictions and illnesses. Mm -hmm. It was, like, really tough. He did a great, like, Abbott and Costello, though, he, like, does a good Dracula, yes. which is really, yes. which is really good. But, yeah, he had a he had a rough life. It was sad. I know. I, I saw the um, Tim Burton and Wood movie. Like, they portray Bella as just, like, this sweet person. And, like, so you really do sympathize with him. Whether or not, like, that's accurate or not, it was still effective for me. <laughs> There's like, I think there's like, there's obviously it's like, a, it's, a, it's a movie. So there's obviously going to be like some kind of like uh, elaborations on it. But like, as far as I understand, like it was like, a, he was genuinely like a nicer old man kind of guy who like really kind of got screwed over by the system because he respected himself and had an idea of what he wanted to be. Like, because he knew that like he gave a lot to the character, right? Like he was Dracula. Like he was one of the w big reasons why that film work so he like had pride in that and was like hey i would like just a little bit more money and i would just like the and like it wasn't even like an outrageous thing and they're like nah nah nah, nah, nah. why do you least. think so was it just like because i know that the the company does have universal has like huge um bankruptcy like a kind of money issues later on down the road mm -hmm. do you think they're just like cheapskates they devalued their workers or they were actually concerned economically why do you think they didn't give bella the credit Oh, I feel like it's the Lemleys. Uh, you know, the, like I feel like they're saving bucks. Like I think it's more like saving bucks in it because, like, all of these, like, one of the truths about Hollywood from the very beginning, and Frankenstein proves this, is that horror movies, it doesn't cost a lot and it makes a ton of money. You like that original Frankenstein movie? I think was like budgeted at two hundred fifty thousand, and then it made Ooh. twelve million, and it made oh, twelve million dollars, especially in nineteen thirties ones. And, like, we're talking during the Great Depression era. Like, that's a lot of money. Yes, um, yes. And uh, it was, like, proof from the start. You, you can make horror movies cheap, and if you put heart in it and you put soul in it, it will get you a ton of money. It's why we. It's why some of the only super non-superhero things we see at the cinema 
are horror movies still because you can make them for cheaper. They're almost always a crowd pleaser. Like people love watching horror movies, but like they're always the the redheaded stepchild, like you were saying, is like yeah. the, the idea that it's just like, oh, we like the darkness, but we cannot admit it. No. Yeah, or we won't give it its credit for being art, basically. Yeah. Um, and that kind of brings to mind. Um, let's see. I did realize that the 2020 Invisible Man was a retelling. I thought it was something different, learning so much. I'm so glad you are Brooklyn. But again, I think this is another franchise more recently that I don't know what's going on these days. I feel like I don't know who's making decisions behind the scenes with marketing or even some movies like their choices of like casting and like all I this. I just know. think it's not like it's not sticking somehow in the early like the 2000s i feel like the 90s kind yeah. of went well with like the mummy but more recently trying to bring the universal monsters to this newer I, generation it's not working i so i love van helsing but van helsing is probably the i love van helsing too i love van helsing i feel like i'm yes. always like the only person in a room who likes van helsing so i'm happy because, with like, hugh jackman yes it's so it's so fun it's so campy but like that movie yes. didn't do well and I think that's probably why, and like no one knows what to do with half of these characters since like Universal Lines, because they went from mummy to all of them. <laughs> and they don't see how that might have been a problem. You already used all the monsters. <laughs> that's kind of the thing. That's sad. I I, I am a uh, Van Helsing stan. I, I am too. it. I try to find it on DVD, but I think my mom has it. But I, I, I couldn't find it streaming anywhere. And that's the problem. That's the problem. Not enough people love Van Helsing. <laughs> <laughs> I, know. I literally will die on that hill. I'm pretty sure I will. I, I will too. I will be right back. I'll be right back. Sorry. Okay, cool. And um, I did want to talk about Liz here when um, she wrote here, you might really like Lindsay Fitzharris's book, The Facemaker, when you teach about disability in World War One. It's so fascinating. Um, I did listen to this one on audiobook. I do feel like for me, when it comes to, like reading nonfiction, I definitely need to get physical copies so I can annotate, take notes. And this one's really cool. And I'm so glad you mentioned it, Liz, because it talks about the um, warfare and all of like the new military advances of World War I that are being used. And therefore, then you have the human impact of that. And so you have like one of the biggest wars right before it being, you know, the Civil War, right? And that you saw like the mini ball, for example, really effective bullets coming from Paris that are being used in, um, you know, warfare on both sides of the United States war. And then you see World War One really ratcheting up all the military warfare. And why this is really interesting is because you see people's faces and bodies where that kind of um, distress and trauma and many people have read the Frankenstein movies to speak on post-World War I trauma, both like the physical, the mental, the emotional, because you see themes of like the outsider. So I'm glad you mentioned this book, Liz. That's a, that is a, that is a great point and a great idea, a great reading of like, it's like, there are things that like the, like say the original Frankenstein where like, at the time would have been problematic, but now almost play into you being able to read it differently. Like for example, like, the criminal brain versus the normal brain. Well, like nowadays, we know like a lot of that was just phrenology. Like, you know yes. what I mean? Like it was junk science. Well, so, yeah. so like, and in, real, in reality, and there's a point where like, uh, you know, uh, Henry Frankenstein was like, oh, it's just dead tissue. Like it doesn't really make a difference. Just dead, dead tissue. And he's actually more right about that than the actual, like, so it's like something that at the time is like based off of problematic science. It actually kind of plays into if you read, if you want to read it about like how we treat people who are differently and how we treat people with yes. disabilities and how we like have built in biases towards certain people and certain uh, aspects of their life uh, or like their background or their history and all this stuff. So like it actually kind of nowadays plays in favor, but probably back in the day was probably like, I could see someone be like, oh, it's like problematic back in the day, but like, cause they only added that because of like basically like studio needed that stuff. You know what I mean? The censors, yeah, all that, yeah. having to edit out the uh, statement of, like, I am a god that yeah. Henry Frankenstein says at the end, and they only, <laughs> like, recently found that footage and, like, added that back in. Oh, I know what it feels like to be god. <laughs> snip, snip, snip. <laughs> That's blasphemous. It's way too blasphemous. Need it out of here. And Cushing has the best vampire kill of all time in Hammer's Bride of Dracula. <laughs> I don't think I've seen that one. I, I'm trying to... 
Yeah, I I believe it. And like, oh, oh, Cushing. Oh, yeah. So Peter Cushing plays Van Helsing in those movies. And uh, he there's a one point, I, I, I don't know if this is what she's talking about, but there's one point where like the final thing happens at a windmill. And what he does is he... he Frankenstein. Well, uh, yeah, no, it's not. I saw it on fire though, but you know, there's a like Dracula's like a, a vampire's like coming at him. He's at a windmill. He like jumps up and makes the windmill into the shape of a cross. Like it makes a windmill to like be positioned to do like the shadow of a cross. How? And then it just kills him. And it's so good. It's so good. Cause it's just like, it has like four stokes in like apparently the perfect line bit. So he just like jumps up, he like gets it. And he's like, aha, it's a cross now, bitch. And he's like, a little oh, convenient. Little it's, too so convenient. convenient. <laughs> it's so convenient. It's ridiculous. I love it. I love that. Okay. So you are saying that your least favorite here is the ghost, ghost of yeah. Frankenstein. Okay. Gotcha. And then what's your top favorite? Oh, Bride of Frankenstein easily. I think Bride of Frankenstein is the best universal monster movie flat out. Um, I, oh. I would say for like, for at least for me, like I, I love that movie so much. Um, and I think like, there are some that are close, like I love, like, I love the original Wolfman. I think the Wolfman's great. Uh, the original Frankenstein is also great. It's just like, when you look at it right after and you see Bride of Frankenstein, you're like, this is like, oh, transcendent. Um, and I, I love Creature from the Black Lagoon as well, which I think is the other, like, like the strongest contender um but yeah i, I love mean, that one <laughs> yeah i love that one so much but i think bride of frankenstein for me is just like my all-timer like it's my favorite my the best like i just i just think it's so good like is I, it the atmosphere like do you care that he's is, speaking in this one or do you feel like that's good development like what do well, you think about yeah, i like that he's speaking because like it feels like it's like i think that the point of frankenstein is probably a little bit more better put across in the bride of frankenstein like because you have that beautiful scene with the like the blind man and like they, they they meet and they like connect over things and they actually have like a real conversation and you you see that like this isn't a thing about like what type of brain you have it's like a, if you're kind to somebody and you know you get in what you put to put out basically and like had henry taken responsibility and like been a good person and not put him in abusive situations he wouldn't have reacted the way he reacted and like if somebody shows him kindness and is nice to him you know it's like anyone you know you, you, you're nice to a person it's it's a good thing to do and it like helps and he like learns and he, he could become a good person like it shows that like he is a response to the environment that he's in which i think it makes the whole point of frankenstein a lot more interesting and, and, and more complex and then you just have Dr. Pretorius, who I think is like oh my the God, greatest yes. character of all time. <laughs> I love Dr. Pretorius. So every scene with Dr. Pretorius, I'm like, just more. He steals Give me it. More. Give yep. me more. And I will never, I will never be more sad. So like when the dark universe, they were trying to do the dark universe and they created this trailer to show off all the things they were going to do in the dark universe. And like they end that trailer with like, here's to a new world of gods and monsters. And I was like, oh my God, are they going to do so a Do good. Dr. Pretorius movie? Like, are we going to get Dr. Pretorius again? And it's like, nah, nah, that movie flopped. And now no one gets any more Dr. Pretorius. Oh. I'm like, no, no. That was at the end of which movie? Uh, well, it was, it was at like, they, they released them. They released the trailer that was supposed to get you hyped up for all the future oh, Dark okay. Universe movies. And they like, gotcha clipped in like all these classic monsters that they were going to have be in these movies and then they never made any of them but like I was so excited for Dr. Pretorius because like he never shows up you don't get any more Dr. Pretorius and it's like we need more Dr. he's a Pretorius. fan favorite he's the yeah. best he's so good he's so good so yeah really I think it's like good. deliciously evil I, I just think that it's like a lot more like three-dimensional characters and I think like a lot of the more like some of the more like problematic ish elements of the original Frankenstein, like about like the abnormal brain and like all this, like all this stuff that like, you know, depending on who you are, you're going to have to have a discussion about like, you know, this is bunk science. You can still read it good. Like, you know what I mean? Like you don't have to have mm -hmm. those discussions in Bride of Frankenstein because it's just boom, bada, boom, bada, boom, bada. And you're already like kind of in it. And it just is, feels a little bit more creative as well. Like I think they let James Wales just, do what he wanted which i think yes. always ends up being it's the atmosphere too yeah. and i think because yeah. of the success of the original frankenstein they gave him a lot more money they gave him a lot more liberty yeah. and i love how gothic it feels like so you're in the gothic. cemetery you're in the mausoleum you're in this like creepy science 
um, building or whatever it is. Like you just have all these settings and all these characters. Like it's it's bleak, but also you have the perspective of the monster way more in this one where yeah. you're able to like really feel not just sad for them, but like they do have a little bit more like action and role in all of it. And it's so interesting how iconic the bride is. I don't feel like anybody really has seen these movies, but they know the bride, they love the bride, and she's literally in it for like two minutes. Yeah, <laughs> she's minutes. like barely in there. And like one of the things is I love that uh, Mary Shelley is like in the, the yes. opening because like there's like some really good stuff in that. Like we need, like that conversation where they're like, oh, I cannot believe such a fair maiden wrote such a terrible story. And she's like, ha 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 ha, I'm just going to continue embroidering me. <laughs> and she's like, <laughs> like, oh, you want more? <laughs> and it's just like, it's it was cool. Like it's like that, like that level of like, you know, you, you can tell women can tell the best horror stories, man. Listen to them. Let them I go. love that. That reminded me. I wanted to say earlier when we were talking about Mary Shelley's Frankenstein that there's a book I was reading. I got about 50% in, but I'm like, oh my God, this is just too big right now. Um, it's a biography written by a woman who uses a lot of other works in there to like challenge oh. some of like these really um like incomplete interpretations of Mary Shelley's life. Right. Um, it's called Romantic Outlaws. And oh. she brings up a critique of even like Mary herself stating the origin of this. Cause in a lot of the forewords when she's still alive, really trying to perfect Frankenstein for her own like vision, she writes about her origins of why she wrote it and how she wrote it. And the author, the historian, the biographer, she's, like just challenging Mary's interpretation of it because at the time she might not have felt comfortable stating that like I came up with this idea just because I'm a competent writer and I have ideas and at the time it's not thought that women could do these kind of things like scientifically and it was just easier for her to say oh I accidentally stumbled upon this idea of Frankenstein by dreaming up the premise of it and then going from there but the author the biographer is like well i don't believe her even when she says these things because it, it could be just easier for her to have said that and it'd be more palatable for the audience to believe a woman was um, capable of that so i'm like oh okay cool even like challenging her and that like maybe the thing she says at the time she's also very limited with what she can offer yeah no that's that is a great point and that's actually something you see a lot about the history of frankenstein is that sometimes the people involved in the movies are not always going to be a complete open about certain things like boris karloff for example was a very private man so when he told stories about how he got involved in the industry and like all this stuff like there was a lot of stuff that just wasn't true and it's like it's not even like uh no shame he just was a private person like he didn't want people like snooping into his private life right so like there are things like uh the origin of the his name boris karloff because he was he was born william henry pratt and he said in, in like interviews he said like karloff was a name from my my mother's my mother's side of the family um and now people have gone back like genealogists and be like we can't find anyone like we have all your records of the family we can't find anyone with the name karloff like we can't find anyone in his history or his family tree with the name karloff in it and it, and he it, boris he said he just like made up on the spot but like karloff <laughs> was something that he like he had uh to, that he wanted to take from his his family history and of course it doesn't mean he's lying by the way just because they don't they haven't found it absolutely but it's yeah. just like uh it's just like something that like there's no been actual any proof that like that portion of the story was correct because certain times in his life he would tell certain stories a little bit differently which of course memory is fallible anyways you know what i mean like mm -hmm. our own memories are fallible so uh and especially if you're an actor you know the the power of a good story so like you know what i mean like so even when you're weaving the tale of your own life like it's one of the things when you're doing research on anything um i noticed that the more worthwhile and concrete and more interesting elements of Boris Karloff's life were written after he passed on because mm. a lot of the earlier stuff went right directly to the source and talked to him about it. And there was a lot of stuff that he just didn't want to talk about, which is totally fair. Like I, you know, respect his privacy, you know what I mean? Like, and, and no, nothing wrong with that, but it's, it's very interesting to, to see when someone goes back and dings up all the history records of like, this person was born here. Here's how many kids, here's how many like relatives he has and blah, 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 blah. His like childhood. And that's how I found out 
that he was literally living in my city for a brief time because uh, he was touring around with a, a, a thing called the Gene Russell Players, which is just like a, he got a he got the job by faking that he had a bunch of acting experience. Like he was born in England. He had a brother who was trying to be an actor. He was really inspired by that, but his brother like went on to do something else because he didn't get too very far. So he immigrates to Canada because he wasn't very close with any of his family. Uh, and he wants to get into acting. What uh, time period is this? Like the this 20s? This is like early 1900s. So oh, okay. he is like working at all these odd jobs. And eventually he like goes like, I'm just going to go and try to get a job acting. And he goes to get like an agent and he just lies his butt off. That's when he comes up, he's on like a train ride. He comes up with Boris Karloff and he comes up with this big fake history of like things that he's done. Now he was like, I had seen all the plays, but of course I haven't acted in any of them. And it's just like, uh, so he, he got his way onto this Gene Russell players and they were going throughout Canada uh, doing various shows and performances. And he was here uh, in my city. And my city actually probably played a big part into like how he became uh, who he is today and how he ended up in, in, in Hollywood because they were cemented in my town for a while, the Gene Russell Players, and they were going throughout, uh, touring throughout the province when a giant tornado hit, the deadliest tornado in Canadian history hit, and destroyed the like the, destroyed like the theaters and put put him out of work and he started to have to go back and work as a person cleaning up things and he had to move on to a different opportunity like that was like farther away and like travel more but like he could have been cemented here if not for a giant cyclone who like got them nature out of the nature, nature intervened <laughs> nature intervened so it was fun because I lost my mind oh yeah. my gosh. And so I went to the memorial where, because like there's a memorial for it, because it happened in 1912 here. So I went to go visit the memorial, and then I went to our provincial archives to like go through like a there's like this old magazine that wrote all about them, and then I looked up the old like newspaper articles from the time, and the very first mention, at least that they can find, there probably there could have been more because they were touring around, but the very first mention that anyone can find in print of Boris Karloff, like the name Boris Karloff was in uh, the Regina Leader, which is my local newspaper, which isn't active anymore, wow. but uh, it was kind of wild to go look at that because I was looking through like old 1900s freaking newspapers and be like, whoa, whoa, oh, there it is, there it is. And it's like, what so are the chances? Painted. Like you're so a mega wild. fan. <laughs> yeah, I was like, ah, oh, this is amazing. So that was amazing. So it's destiny. I love that. And I'm curious, why do you think Boris Karloff um ditched his name? Because I do know that he, I feel like I've read a little bit of stuff that like he feel like he kind of struggled with the um at the time when you have all these movie executives, these casting directors, when they look at him, they're perceiving him as like this dark figure, like he could be the villain, that kind of thing. And I think he does definitely get typecasted as that. And for me, I feel like there's this associations with people of color, with being, you know, the negativity of like dark villain, that kind of thing, and using that exotification to portray villains in these early Hollywood yeah. movies. And I feel like he struggled as like being biracial, like that yeah. he kind of looks maybe American, uh, not American Indian, but like um, Indian, like from India, but yeah. then also he has that British background. So I feel like the name, all of that, I feel like there has to be a connection there with like his struggle um, being a biracial man in early Hollywood. Yeah, and oh, some of the roles he had to take are, oh, 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 not good, not good. If you like any old timey actor, do not look up their name uh, and the, the character Fu Manchu because they probably played it and it probably oh. looked awful. Yes. Christopher Lee did it too and it's very yes. bad. It's very bad. Uh, if you don't know, that is a very racist uh, villain of the time. Like Fu Manchu was this very big pulp character uh, that was a completely racist uh, character. So uh, not good if anyone played them, but uh, he had to play like uh, in a lot of like Westerns. He was almost always the villain in, uh, you know, in, in movies. Like I think the one of the big reasons why he got cast in Frankenstein was because there was a this movie called The Criminal Code. And he was like a villain in that. He was like a mobster. And like he had like a really striking presence. So like that's how he kind of got the audition for uh to do frankenstein like there was a bit of like 
there's like some fanciful history of like him being like, I was eating at the commissary. And then James Whale came in and he was like, oh, look at that man. Yes, I've heard that one many times. Yes, like the forehead was apparently the cue of like his vision as the makeup artist. Yeah, and there's like, there's like a few conflicting stories, like where sometimes it was like a a, a movie executive saw him and something else was like, oh, you might be good for this. Here, do a makeup test. You know what I mean? Like that one sounds a little bit more realistic, but like, hey, who knows? Who knows? You know, print the legend. Um, I love a good disco- discovery story. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 very fun. Uh, but yeah, so there, there's all kinds of like interesting things about that. But he was definitely kind of because he was 44 years old when he played the creature. Like that's wild. Like he had been yes. he done 65 movies and serials, all like background players, all little parts before he got the job. And then as soon as he got the job, he exploded. Like he became like a huge star later but, in life. But in the original Frankenstein, they didn't even invite him to the premiere. He didn't even get invited to the premiere because they're just like, oh, he's just a guy. He's just a guy. And then all of a sudden it's like, yeah, he is a guy and he is making you all your money. So you best uh, be nice to him. Uh, like, cause like, uh, have you ever seen Arsenic and Old Lace? You know what that is? Yes. Like? It's one of my childhood classics my mom would have in the rotation. Yes. I had no he's idea. in there. <laughs> yeah. I had no idea he was in there. And there was a character specifically written for him that was like designed to look like Frankenstein, like in its makeup and stuff like that. And he played it on stage for years upon years upon years. And it's just like wild to think about like they like after Frankenstein, people were literally writing parts for him and based off of him. And it's like it was it very much like changed his his, his life. So it's really interesting. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I think he's incredibly important to this franchise. Unfortunately, his last movie out of the three, uh, out of all the movies you see here on the screen, are going to be the first three, I believe, right? He's not in Ghost of Frank. Is he in Ghost of Frankenstein? No, but he's in House of Frankenstein. Yes, but, he's not, but not as Frankenstein. Yeah. No, but uh, there's, there's a bunch of like nice stories because Glenn Strange played like Frankenstein in those. And he's not bad. Like I, they don't give him much to do. Better than like, Lon Chaney, personally. He's definitely better than Lon Chaney, <laughs> and he's definitely better than Bella Lugosi. Is Frank- like both of those actors should not okay, have played Frankenstein. I had a question for you. Okay, so I was I'm dying to know. So we we love this franchise for better or for worse, um, especially those like first three. Um, I feel like my least favorite is probably going to have to be like House of Frankenstein, House of Dracula, and I think my fave is probably going to be The Bride or Abbott and Costello. It's kind of hard to choose there, but I would be curious knowing that Bella Lugosi was actually tied to playing Frankenstein in the beginning uh, because he was such a success, surprisingly, to the movie executives with Dracula that, like, Carl Lemley Jr., he was trying to seek out Dracula. Um, the the player of that was Bella Lugosi, so he was trying to get him, convince him to do it, but Bella was like, no, I need more money. I don't want this non-speaking role. And so they went with Boris Karloff, ultimately. Do you feel like if they would have casted Bella that that would have totally changed this franchise and like what it eventually became. Well, I, there's there's a big difference between Bell Lugosi by the time of Frankenstein meets a Wolfman and Bell Lugosi at the time of the original Frankenstein. You know what I mean? Like like he was a much younger man then. Like he could have done a lot of this stuff. Like I don't. I think so much of the reason why Frankenstein is iconic is because of the face. And, like, yes. I don't know if anyone else could have done that face. Because, like, literally one of the ways that the face on that original Frankenstein looks so good is because, like, Boris Karloff had fake teeth he, like, took out. So it looks a little bit more sunken in his thing. So it looked a little more cadaverous. And, like, that 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 iconography is there. So, like, I don't – like, cause I don't know if Bela Lugosi could have pulled off the face. It probably would have looked a lot different. Um, so it's really hard to say because it's, like – it's almost an entirely different universe at that point because um, there would be so much different with him in the role. Now, I would be interested to see him play a Frankenstein that was literally like the book Frankenstein, which would have been kind of cool. Like, you know what I mean? I like, can have, see like, a more that. Like, more like verbose, that. like, a, yes. you know, Linkin Park listening Frankenstein. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yes, yes, I can totally see that. And I do feel like he does really well playing Igor later on. I think he gets a lot of credit by film critics for that role. I think that was where he really shines. I don't know if he would have, to me, I feel like his, um, gosh, I don't know. I think I just been indoctrinated with the Boris Karloff Frankenstein. Yeah. yeah I just hard. can't imagine anyone else playing that role. No, no. And it's, 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 it's just one of those things. It's just one of those things. 
Oh, but have you ever seen Frankenstein 1970? Which is no, I haven't. Like, oh my goodness! So this is a movie that was made in the fifties, and it was supposed to be like a oh, this is the future of the seventies. And like in that is like the last time that Boris Karloff kind of plays the monster. So he's the doctor throughout most of that, and he's like wheelchair bound. But the the last scene of the movie, like there's a reveal of the monster's face, and it's only the face, and it looks exactly like him because he like he made him the monster in his image. It's not good. It's not good, but it's Why would they return to that? Because I feel like at the end of, like, Son of Frankenstein, he was like, I'm never going to return back. Maybe just, like, to the monster itself, but it's, he comes back into the franchise and then does other stuff. Why does he do that? Uh, money. Like, it's like money yeah. was very tight. And, 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 like, after that early big run of, like, monster movies, like, things dried up and he kind of had to take what he could get you know it's it's like one of those scenarios where like he always gave it his all but like sometimes he just i think he, he was over it like just so he was over, definitely it. over it he Creatively. was definitely over it yeah so it's really not a good movie but it is a movie i watch and know <laughs> <laughs> i love it um and then we have some uh apparently useless trivia uh facts director paul thomas anderson's dad ernie was the horror host gulardi are you familiar with this horror host no i'm not but i love old school horror hosts horror hosts are like one of my favorite weird things to get in like get obsessed with because there's so many good ones i love that i actually picked up from the library um the vampira one of the movies oh. and then there's another one i think it's like the sequel so i for i feel like it's just perfect halloween so halfway to halloween in april i think i'm gonna like get into it. vampira read her memoir watch some of her stuff yes. i'm very interested in that because she was 80s or 90s or oh oh long. sorry you're talking about elvira oh sorry elvira yeah see well, this is how well, um little well, i know <laughs> well come well because like elvira is a play off of vampira so you're, you're not wrong because like vampira okay. was like in the the early fifties, and she's in a few Ed Wood movies, but she looks yes. she looks a more Tisha Adams looking like person like in the flesh, and like that's where a lot of Elvira was based off of. I believe she was originally pitched as being the new Vampira, but weird rights issues happened, so then she became Elvira. So it's you're basically right. <laughs> okay, cool. Yes, I'm, so I'm gonna have my whore host era. That's that's my point. <laughs> Um, Liz is saying that she just realized the Frankenstein and Gunsmoke connection via Glenn Strange. I knew I recognized him. She's loving all the film facts. He's, he's like, uh, Glenn Strange is like a bartender on Gunsmoke, but like he, like, cause he was just a stunt man. He did a whole bunch of stuff and they were like, oh, we need someone to do Frankenstein. And apparently like on set of House of Frankenstein, Boris Karloff was really nice to just talk Glenn Strange through it and be like, here's how you do it. And this is how I think the monster should be played. And you're like, ah, it's so funny. I love that. And the perfect last name for somebody who's playing the Frankenstein monster. <laughs> Her movie is so stupid, but so fun. Okay, good. That's good to know. Oh, it's great. It's it's amazing. Elvira, Mistress of the Dark is so good. Yeah. It's so Okay, good. cool. It, oh. It's totally giving me like Halloween vibes. So I feel like I want to kind of Well, it, it is. Yeah, it's, it's very much like a Halloween vibes. It's very fun. It's very fun. I love it. Awesome. So is there anything else we might need to know? Any fact about the franchise or any of the key players a part of this as like, you know, fans or newbies to Universal Monsters Frankie Sign. Yeah, the only thing that like we've kind of like briefly touched on, like Jack Pierce, though. Oh, everyone's gotta give Jack Pierce. Who is name. Jack Pierce for somebody who has no clue? So Jack Pierce is the one who did all the makeup on uh Frankenstein. There's a reason why the creature looks the way the creature looks. Uh, and it was like a combination of him and Karloff. They worked really closely together. And because there was like such a good relationship between the two, that's why the creature looks so good. It's because like they both talked about what they think was best for the character. And like Jack Pierce brought all these like weird ideas to it where he's like, ah, oh, he is a, you know, he is a doctor. So he is going to be very utilitarian in his design. That's why the dome has like the chop head. Cause like he looked up all the different ways somebody could dissect a head to look at the brain. And he's like, oh, he's, he's a doctor. He's utilitarian. He's going to go so boom. Much and, thought. Oh, and like I pop it out. And like, that's why you got like the things there. And he's like, oh, it's going to need the electrodes. Obviously, he needs a place with the electricity. Like, and like th that alone is like, huge right like that those like those electrodes like that none of that existed before this like that is the 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 idea of frankenstein that we have today is from the movie because of jack pierce and like all of these really creative ideas like using shoe polish for his nails uh oh like, i didn't know that they have like asphalt spreader shoes are like the big boots that he wears and like creative things too like where they would the 
the the the reason why his long arms look so long is just because they poorly tailored the suit. They just made the the arms shorter. They they just had a, a suit. Oh. They like made it made use creative tailoring to make it look like it was longer. Like an optical illusion. Yeah, yeah. And they like had to get double quilted. Like the vest is like double stacked for like his like muscles and stuff. So like it was just really a creative combination of the two and it is uh, such a shame that like he kind of just got written off by the studio which uh, um movies it does he fade out from like which ones is he not doing the makeup for i believe he's only doing it for the first three i'd have to double check because i know it's the first two i'm not 100 percent sure on son of frankenstein i believe he was still doing it for son of frankenstein i want to but... say yes with boris I yeah because i think it's like the, the combination of the two were working but i think after that he's like He's he's out of there. But you can significantly see a change in the makeup after uh, Son of Frankenstein. Yes, you can. For worse. <laughs> yes, you can. Yes, you can. It's like, oh my goodness. And like, there's even stuff like the eyes are like, they use mortician's wax and like put it on like the eyes. So it kind of like weighs down the eyes a little bit. And like, there's all these like very creative ways that like really impact why the creature looks so good and why he like, there's such an impact to, you know, to that character is all because of that. Now, this isn't super surprising. I mean, we, Universal never really treated their makeup guys that well. I mean, there's the big thing about uh, Millicent Patrick, who did and created <gasps> yes, the ideas the and the look for the creator of the Black Lagoon yeah. and how she basically got no credit at the time and got like screwed out of like this history that she should have always been a part of because yes. the creature of the Black Lagoon is another very iconic, amazing design. Like it's so good. And I, I think that's maybe also why I think like of the two, like like my favorite monsters are the ones that have the most monstrous monsters. You know what I mean? Like it's, mm -hmm. and there's all these like, uh, but going back to Frankenstein, there's all these like little details with Jack Pierce's makeup that you don't even think about. Like, so like they, to make it look like he was able to be more expressive and have human reactions, they would change the makeup, like from take to take a little bit so that he would be like, ah, and you're like, you'd be like, oh, now it feels more real because all of these facial emotions are able to be expressed, but they're only be able to express because they have to like specifically redesign the makeup. Yes. And not a things. mask, not just something yeah. just put over your face. Nope, nope. And it's, oh, it's time consuming. It's time consuming. And like, apparently like it was super hot on set. So like he would have to be there to do like on set little touch ups and like also like have eye wash because it would just keep getting in, all that makeup would keep getting into Boris Carl's eyes. So like, <laughs> he would just have to be like, whoop, eye wash, eye wash. Okay, you're good, Boris. Let's touch this up and you go back out. And it's like, it's like crazy. And again, it would not have worked that these two men did not get along because they were oh, yeah. a lot together. Like, I heard that there was like also collaboration between them. It's so, like the heavy island thing, I guess was like Boris, Laura will have it. It was like Boris Karloff's recommendation. And then later on when you don't have Jack Pierce there and they're basically just using like a mask situation. I was reading one of the reading, I was watching one of the featurettes and I think it's probably like in that one of the house movies or something, maybe in Wolf, the Wolfman one, um, where they talk about how the person who plays it, I think it was Glenn Strange, where he's wearing the mask of Frankenstein. And because of like, you know, he's working, he's like sweating and stuff. Oh, it'll like accumulate. And then when they take off the mask, there's like a bucket of, of his sweat water that comes out because it's not breathable. It's not real. Like he's not getting prop, like whatever those things on it. It's like literally a mask because they've made it as quick as possible to like kind of churn these movies out. And I was like, that's so gross. Yeah, oh yeah, it's gross. It's gross. And it also like it was it, it had effects on their health because like those were not good, especially well, I I think like literally after like he had to like uh in the original sports call had to like bathe in like acetone for like two hours to get all the makeup off of him. Like oils and acetones and like all these things where I'm like, oh that cannot have contributed to your lifespan. Like that is that's probably not good. I can like the paint. Stuff. like yeah. i'm sure there is like lead so, who knows oh yeah and he and it was like it was so hard on his body that he had like back pains for years after that like can you imagine f being 40 years old and having to do all that like, it's like he did it, it was the carrying of um of henry frankenstein oh, yeah. that apparently gave him back problems for life yep oh and it was like i think i think they like the estimates for how much it all weighed were like varied but like about 48 pounds of extra stuff on him to, to do all that. And it was just like crazy. I didn't think I realized he was that old. So I'm glad you brought it up 
because the things that he had to do, like it was, it's a very physical role, like when he's just living, but then also like a lot of the, you know, pushing people and carrying people, like for somebody to be over 40 and doing that repeatedly, like literally throwing a girl in uh, the water, like that's physical multiple times. It's not just like one take. So it makes sense why he talks about having all of those like issues later on in his life. Yeah. Yeah. And oh man, that water scene was apparently one of the worst ones to do because like it inflated into his suit. Like, uh, like, cause there's that scene in Bride of Frankenstein when it opens and there's like all that water, apparently like when he's like under the windmill kind of like cave thing, apparently that all like got into a suit and he was like floating around and like it like <sighs> injured himself. Cause it got, he like puffed oh, no. up because all the air got in there. And yeah. He, like, injured him. Yeah. It was like wild. So he went through it for making these movies. Like it's wild. Yes. Yeah. And I'm, it, it, they're iconic for a reason because he did such a phenomenal job. So just wanting to, Oh, going back to like Vampira, Vampira and me. Oh, okay. So I would love to watch this documentary. Yeah, it's too. on Tubi. Oh, Tubi has like everything there. You have no idea how many how many weird Frankenstein movies are on Tubi. Have you seen them? <laughs> I've seen a lot. They have like a lot of them. And they have like the random ones, like Frankenstein meets the space monster and like all that stuff. When I was writing, so I <laughs> so I I I had like all this in my journal, like when I was doing all my research. And like I called the everything I did like Franken Facts for the one page. Wait, but that's so to, cute. Franken Facts. I need to read like I need to like keep going so like i did bride of frankenfax son of frankenfax ghost of frankenfax andrew meets frankenfax house of frankenfax and then i did uh lauren and andrew meet frankenfax for, like, oh my god that is, i made it <laughs> and then i was like oh no i'm i, I had more pages i'm like oh no i'm out of universal movies uh i guess i'll go to the hammer one so i'm like curse of frankenfax the revenge of frankenfax Endless. <laughs> Frank and Facts created women. Yeah, sorry, I did a lot. I'm almost done. Don't worry. Uh, Frank and Facts conquers the world, which is the giant monster one. Um, <laughs> and then there's War of the Frank and Facts, which is based off of War of the Gargantuas, the other giant monster movie that's about Frankenstein. <laughs> Endless. This is what I'm saying. Like, so much has been made off of this, like, one series you see here on your screen. And of course, oh, Katrina heard Tubi and she comes running back. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you you are the to be queen, yes. <laughs> the to be queen. I love it, yes. And then um, somebody mentioned here, um, they're mistaken about like Liz's uh, channel. Liz does produce content for horror and literally any opportunity I have to plug her podcast that she does with two other people, it's phenomenal. It's called The Horror Homeroom and they mm. talk about a movie, they dive into it with spoilers and they do a lot of what we've been doing here, which is just like talking about um, the legacy and the, the portrayals and the changes over time, like all that stuff. So if you love horror movies and sometimes we talk about books, definitely check out The Horror Podcast anywhere that you stream your podcasts. It's my little plug. I love that because we love um, horror and um, you must too, if you've been with us for about an, almost two hours. So I'll, I'll <laughs> want it here. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm so sorry, sorry Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I was going to be the one apologizing. I'm the one who came with five pages of notes. <laughs> I'm so here for it. I have nowhere to go. I just want to be conscious of your time. So I really appreciate it. And I think if um, you could sum up in um, a, a few words here, why do you love Frankenstein and why do you feel like people should give um, at least the first two um, a shot, even if they've never read the actual Mary Shelley book? I would say it's like the ultimate tale of the outsider and like how we treat those who are different and how like, you know, there's a lot to be gained from just like learning about being a good human being from these movies where it's like taking responsibility for your actions create responsibility for your mistakes like it's like all about self-responsibility is like key to all of these movies and if they just like had taken responsibility and been good people and like taken care of if you create life you should take care of the life you know do everything in your power to like look after the things that you create or the things that are in your life and own up to your own mistakes and also just, you know, whenever you need a vibe, just watch Kat, uh, Dr. Pretoria's drinking in a, in, a, in a mausoleum and you're like, that's Literally. my, that's my night. That's my night. <laughs> Literally, like if, if anything comes about this, I'm assigning people homework to watch or rewatch. 
the first Frankenstein movie and Bride of Frankenstein, if you stop there, I don't think you're missing out on anything. But if you're really, really into Frankenstein, just knowing the whole timeline and the story, I found it very fun and silly and interesting because I just feel like you just see so much of other monsters in there. But it, it's 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 hilarious, especially when you end with Abbott Costello, which is like comedic. You just see this whole arc, so this good. whole storyline. It's so entertaining. It's it's one of those things where, like, you know, modern day things, people are very they want status franchises where they don't want franchises to grow and change. And like you you oh, it's, it's always men on the internet get real mad about anything that changes. They're like I can't Ghostbusters. Believe, I can't <laughs> believe a lady is a Ghostbuster now. Yeah. It's like, but that was really funny, and I love that movie. I, I really like the twenty sixteen one. But like, but like anything that changes, like people get mad about the changes, and like people also get real up in arms about continuity and how things follow and flow. And you're like, these movies do not flow well together. There's a lot of plot holes. There's a lot of inconsistencies. Actors change. The burger mask from the first one is like this big jovial fat man. And then he goes to this guy with like this, this small man, a skinny <laughs> man with a mustache. And it's supposed to be like the same character. You know what I mean? Like there's like, there, there, you are not meant to be like, how does this fall into the greatest cinematic universe? And it's not meant to just be the same thing over and over again. Yes. These movies are best when they're given creative control to flow and change and alter and yes maybe they'll have a giant weird musical number in a movie like frankenstein meets the wolf man where it's like we are here to celebrate all like, the german that? yeah <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> the weird the the german melody and i love it so much but it's so random but like that's the kind of stuff you get when you don't take things so seriously and it's when i like I like a lot of movie tie-in fiction, right? Like I, I read a lot of movie tie-in books, uh, like an alien books, right? And like the things that I like about those are what I like about a franchise like this is that like they are able to just do their own thing and they're just like a framework that they're following, but they're able to change and alter and do their own thing within those frameworks. And the worst ones of those are the ones that don't do anything new and are just the same thing over and over again, so exactly yes and the only thing you probably would ever find if you're watching the series to be repetitive is going to be the fact that frankenstein <laughs> never dies like he will go through, like how do you stay alive in frozen well, i don't know <laughs> but i don't care <laughs> how does how does he drop into a molten like i i read one of the books was like talking about how preposterous it is that like they're like oh yeah this molten pit that's been going for millions and millions of years that's never dried out ever and then like the next movie it's like yeah so the uh, molten pit dried up and we <laughs> excavated frankenstein from it. <laughs> like, yeah in the quicksand somehow yeah. they get out of the quicksand and go down a mountain <laughs> yeah they go down a mountain they end up, it's like okay sure that's like, i don't i don't care i love it i'm here for it why not why not this is so silly i love it yeah that's like why not right that's the the whole franchise and you mentioned that um, it's the one franchise that you feel like is the most fleshed out, that is the most expansive. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I think like for quality wise, uh, like there's probably the most that I really like out of that. But like, I think, I think the one that's probably the most experimental is the Invisible Man franchise. Cause it's the most, it's barely a franchise, but it is also a franchise. Like there's no real continuity, but they're also the same kind of movies all time. Like they're kind of a, still a franchise. It's very strange, but they're the most experimental, but from just like start to finish of like a universal monsters franchise that like, even the worst ones, I don't like ghost of Frankenstein, but it's still fun to watch. Like it's not, yes, it's not gonna, yeah. I don't get that mad watching it. I just, it's just, you the said that just expectations. Yeah. 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 And like the only thing I would recommend with the franchise is maybe watch Frank, like Frankenstein and bride of Frankenstein wait a few days maybe wait a week maybe go next month wait, and yes. then go through the rest of the franchise because yes. going from bride which is the peak pinnacle of pinnacle uh of i think the entire universal thing in going to sun which i love but is not bride of Frankenstein. Yes. it's just like there is a uh, a downhill from there but there are still very fun it's just hard to go from one to the other uh they're it's not very charming marathon. yeah they're not a marathony franchise until you hit Frankenstein meets the Wolfman really because like that one to Abaddon and Costello it's a pretty easy just you just watch all of them 
Oh yes, I love Abbott Costello. They are so adorable. Yeah, I'm, I'm also at the same time, um, I have a year long goal to get through the entire Chucky franchise, which I've literally never seen. Like none of these are rewatches. And I feel like that has a lot of marathon ability because you have a lot of the same creators who are a part of that. Don't get me wrong, they're very different in terms of like, you know, moving through the franchises, but I feel like it doesn't have, like the, Fra the Frankenstein franchise, it's distinctive where things are changing and evolving in ways that I don't yeah. think the Chucky franchise does as far as I've seen so far. How far are you into the Chucky franchise? I have not been able to, because I think March, I've been watching tons of movies. Yeah. Um, I've, I haven't, I'm kind of stalling out with that, but I'm going to get back into it in April. I've gotten to um, the Curse of Chucky. I finished that one. Oh, oh, you okay? You've got because I, I feel like Bride and Seed are very different. <laughs> like, I, but I like love Bride so much. <laughs> yeah, like they're just Seed very, is very different. different too. Yeah, yeah. So like those are like the only like outliers, and then it kind of goes back into what yes. it was doing before, yes. which is very. It's a strange franchise, but it's interesting. But like Bride, you know that that type of a sequel name is only because of Bride of Frankenstein. Like, I'm so glad that came up. Yes, I once I like watched um, Bride again because I watched um, The Bride of Chucky um, before, and then I watched this like relatively soon after. Um, I was like astounded by how much love they showed Bride of Frankenstein in that movie. Yeah, and like, they didn't even want to call it Bride of Frankenstein, like it, it was a fight. They were originally gonna either call Which it- Which uh, Well, like, uh, I think it was like James Whale and the studios. Like, cause the, like they oh, were like, right. they filmed it under the return of Frankenstein. And then they also have Frankenstein Lives Again is one of the two titles that were going back and forth. And someone's like, we must do Bride. It must be Bride. And we're so much better for it because- yeah, but like she's like so. I feel like it's it maybe sets up mis expectations oh, because you, she's you're not wrong. Yeah, she's yeah. not. Yeah, she's barely. But it is, is the seeking of that partner, that companionship, that is the next step in the the, the monster's evolution. But it, to me, it just like again hits on something I observed and haven't like mentioned here. But I have picked up on the ways that they try to market any movie in the Frankenstein franchise on their posters specifically. They really play up like the woman in peril, the white woman in peril, <laughs> even though they play such minor roles in basically all of these movies, but they're on the movie posters. And to me, it brings up the whole like racial dimension and dynamic oh, of like yeah. King Kong. And you can kind of like place in the King Kong, any kind of creature, right? With like oh, yeah. the perils of I like vulnerable like women white women you know yeah yeah i've done a big research project on king kong really that, that was a while there's a lot of stuff to that one um uh which is another movie i love but is definitely there's definitely stuff to talk talk about when that one comes up um uh, but it's so interesting when you mention that is because like most of the time those posters were made before the movies like the frankenstein uh, one the very early frankenstein ones it's like if you look at some of the posters for the original 31 Frankenstein, he's a giant with laser eyes. And you're like, what is going on here? And like, they're just like, oh, we just wanted to market it. We didn't even, they didn't even like finalize the look. There's like, man, whatever. It's like, oh. That is so good to know. Yeah. Like the after the fact, and they've changed so much of their editing. Like you mentioned, yeah. taking out backstories for characters that you're like, okay, well then things happen later on, but then you don't really have the understanding for like how we got there. So it makes sense if things are like so in flux. And they're just thinking about how they can get people in those theater seats during the Great Depression. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. We're just, oh, that's a, that was a terrible time to advise. Yes, exactly. Somehow this was really profitable during that time. Um, but we have um, come to it at the end. I'm so sorry, Andrew. <laughs> no, I, I, I learned so much. I mind. This is great. Okay, awesome, great. So um, folks have been um, letting us know that this was super fun. They were learning a lot. Thank you so much for being here, everybody, live, taking yes, time out you. of your day. We really appreciate that, um, to have folks who are you know leaving comments in the chat, all of that. And then if you're here watching, listening um, during the replay, like you're, you know, found this months, I don't know, years after, <laughs> let us know in the chat if you learned anything new, if you have any of your own facts to share. We'd love to hear those. Yeah, if you find it at this at the bottom of a molten pit and you unearth it, and you're like, whoa, this chat lives again. And you're like, all right, well, there you go. Let us know. Yeah, I want the return of the, the chat. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, and then also, I believe I have um, Andrew's uh, page linked down below. If not, I'll add that when I add the notes for um, anything that like we referenced here. We're big, yeah. like, you know, history, oh. attributors, so we'll leave that down below here. And thank you so much for being here, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. And we'll see you when we see you. Toodaloo. Bye.